Part one of our off-season football preview next on Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. <laughs> In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Throws it and a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got it. And a leaping interception by Watson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Michigan, but Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schimbeck. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Second. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be missing again. Go Blue, I'm Steve Dace. Welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. And it is part one of our two-part episode, part two being next week, looking at the biggest issues of the offseason. Next week, we're going to take a look at the biggest issues in college football from an offseason perspective nationally and from the Big Ten. This week, strictly looking at the maize and blue and our beloved Michigan Wolverines. By the way, we are approaching... 2,000 subscribers here on our YouTube channel. We can't thank you enough for that. If you've not yet subscribed, and we get well over 2,000 views uh, pretty much for every single one of these episodes we've done so far. In fact, we're about two weeks removed from, I think, our most viewed episode ever. So if you've not yet subscribed, we greatly appreciate it. If you would, leave us a positive review, comment here on YouTube, or if you just strictly listen to the podcast version on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play, we would appreciate that as well. Chris Ballas from the Wolverine is going to be joining us to give us his expert analysis coming up a little bit later on in this week's episode. But we're going to begin with what I think, looking ahead now into what I believe is a very pivotal offseason for the ability of a Michigan program with, I think, deserve it, high expectations, given the resume of our head coach. What do we need to see this offseason? What needs to happen this offseason for Michigan to realize those expectations? I believe there are eight ifs, eight ifs to be watching this offseason. And we're going to start off this week's episode by tackling them one by one. The first if, the big one. If Shea Patterson is eligible. One of my favorite sayings in college football, you can't hide your quarterback in college football. Did we not learn that? harsh lesson this year well Steve look at Alabama they don't have great quarterback play um well uh Greg McElroy their first national championship quarterback got drafted in the NFL and played a few years um the next quarterback that backed him up uh, AJ McCarron is still in the NFL the year they didn't win the playoff they didn't have an NFL quarterback they had a converted running back They didn't win it two years ago with a freshman quarterback who was being outplayed by the greatest quarterback in Clemson football history, Deshaun Watson, who was tremendous as a rookie before he got hit or hurt. So, yes, even at Alabama, with five stars at every position, they also 
cannot hide their quarterback in college football. How did they win the national championship a few weeks ago? They benched their limited quarterback and put the better one in, okay? And he won them the game. So not even mighty Alabama with its NFL farm team can hide its quarterback in college football. Michigan doesn't need affirmative answers to all of the eight questions we're going to address here during this week's episode because that would make them a perfect team and there is no such thing. But there are some that they have to get an affirmative answer for. I believe this is one of them. And if it's not Shea, if it's not Shea, and I believe he will be eligible, I just think there's no way the NCAA is going to rule him ineligible when it's flirting with giving automatic transfer status to any underclassman. Uh, if you're going to go down that road, then of course I don't see what you're standing for not making Shea Patterson eligible would be. So if he's not eligible, then someone else has to step up. Brandon Peters, Dylan McCaffrey, someone else needs to step up because if this first if isn't answered, it's probably going to make the rest of them pretty irrelevant. They don't have to get them all. don't have to answer them all affirmatively, but this one, they clearly do. If Grant Newsom can go, there's a lot of potential at the tackle spots, but not really a lot of proven productivity in Grant Newsom before he got hurt in 2016. With that gruesome injury, I thought was looking like a next level Michigan offensive lineman. The kind of tackles we saw, if you're about my age or a little bit older growing up, that Michigan routinely put into the National Football League. Can he go? Can he recover from that gruesome injury that almost cost him his leg? He's been cleared to work out in the offseason, not yet cleared for contact. But if he could go, even if he's not quite where he was before the injury, he still can provide a lot of stability that gives more time to the Chuck Filiagas, Andrew Stubers at all to develop during the course of this offseason. The next if Michigan has to tackle this offseason, if not Grant Newsom, then if some redshirt freshman offensive tackles can emerge, like the aforementioned Andrew Stuber, Chuck Filiaga, it is possible that Michigan could line up at Notre Dame in the season opener in September with five top 100 recruits on the offensive line. I wouldn't expect that. I wouldn't expect those new guys to all be ready. I would expect that's why I think they're going after the Rice transfer and a lot of other big-time programs are, are going after him as well. But at some point, they need one of those redshirt freshman offensive tackles to show he is ready to play. James Hudson, throw his name in there as well. At some point... Those guys have got to maybe not be as precocious as Jeff Backus was as a redshirt freshman starter on the 97 National Championship team, but they've got to be ready to be upgrades over what we've already seen. The next if for the Michigan football team this offseason, if we can actually coach our wide receivers, the development of that position this year was abysmal. And it, it wasn't just freshman receivers. I said, if you go back, One of the episodes we did right before the season started, I warned you, don't buy all the hype of the freshman wide receivers. Freshman receivers, even great ones, or guys that go on to be great ones, often don't make a big impact. I go back to Calvin Ridley at Alabama in recent years. That's about the only one. It usually takes a year or two. And in a pro-style offense, where it's not just a simple one-read, check-down route tree, but more is being asked of you, and you've got to be more technically proficient, that's an even harder ask for freshman receivers. So I don't fault the pace of development for Donovan Peoples-Jones, for example. What I'd like to know is what the hell happened to like Eddie McDoom all offseason? Why, why, why wasn't Kakoa Crawford ready to step forward? I mean, what happened to Grant Perry? Those are the guys that should have been ready to fill larger roles. And you know what? Their recruiting profiles weren't any bigger than Jehu Chesson's. Amara Darbo was considered a big-time recruit. But, you know, um, uh, so was Eddie McDoom. So was Kakoa Crawford. Why didn't those guys develop? Are we going to actually coach that position this year? That's one of the ifs to be looking for this offseason. The fifth if, if our running backs aren't complete, total, indescribable abominations in pass pro, that was two words, brutal. 
watching Michigan's running backs pass protect this year. It was almost as if we were aiding and abetting the decapitation of our own quarterbacks. The technique was dreadful. The biggest running back we had. Well, Steve, our running backs weren't that big. Mike Hart, 5'7". He stood in the gap. He took shots. He did his job. Jamie Morris, 5'7". He stood in the gap. He did his job. I'm not buying that. Ty Isaac, like 6'2", 6'3", 240 pounds, shied away from contact frequently as as a pass protector. And what was this brutal chicken wing? What the hell was that? I mean, that's not pass protection, man. That's you got him defense. You see in you know poorly coached college basketball team. So that's one of the biggest things to be watching this offseason. Will the pass pro of our running backs, if you're going to play a pro style offense, pass pro of running backs is a necessity and it's something we did not have this season. The next if to watch this offseason, if our safeties can cover. We got about midway through the season against Penn State and Joe Moorhead, who's now the head coach of Mississippi State, realized, hey, I'm not going to throw against LaVert Hill and David Long. That's a waste of my time. So I'm going to isolate my best receivers in the slot against their safeties and nickel corners and exploit that. And boy, did Penn State show a roadmap for the rest of college football. And we saw that as a consistent weakness, really the only weakness of our defense exploited the rest of the way. Now we're hoping this transfer from Utah, who's long and fast, might be able to address that. We have several other big-time recruits, two other top 100 recruits, Ambry Thomas, Benjamin St. Just, backing up Lavert Hill and David Long. They should be more developed and ready to go in in the coming year as well because this is really the only weakness returning on our defense. Nickel safety coverage is a must if you're going to play as much man coverage as Don Brown likes to play. The seventh if. If we can beat a rival when they're good. Now, we may not get an answer to that during the offseason. But you can look at what's going on with your rivals in the offseason and and size up what that might mean they might look like when you play them in the actual season. It's been an interesting offseason for Michigan State. They've had a couple of kids, including Andre Risen, a legacy recruit, his son transfer. They've actually lost assistant coaches at Michigan State. That's not something that has been commonplace for Mark D'Antonio. But they do return 20 starters. Uh, When you look at Ohio State, This offseason's gone about as well for them as they probably could have hoped for. They didn't lose Greg Schiano to a head coaching position. Uh, They didn't lose Ryan Day. They're much ballyhooed. That's kind of their Chris Partridge, if you will, although he's more of a coordinator than a position coach. They didn't lose him to another job when he was being wooed. Yes, they lost a couple guys early to the NFL. Ohio State always will, but they actually returned more than they expected, including Draymond Jones, who I think will be a big-time menace for them in the middle of their defense. So Ohio State's offseason did not have the tumult and the turnover. Probably we as Michigan fans would have hoped. Michigan State's had a little bit more than they probably expected. Our opening opponent, Notre Dame, is having a very rough offseason. These are all things we'll cover more next week in part two of our offseason preview. But, but that helps to give you an idea of, hey, even if we have a good offseason, can we beat one of our rivals when they're actually good? Which means, can we win some games of more significance? And this brings us to the final if of the offseason. If we can beat a ranked team on the road, and we're going to get the answer to that week one, about 220 days from now, on the road at Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame will be ranked. They'll be ranked a little higher than us would be my guess, although I think our personnel going into this season is superior to theirs. But as I've already mentioned, they've had a rough offseason. I think there's been two coordinator hires the last two years in college football that saved a head coach's job. I thought two years ago, Joe Moorhead saved James Franklin's job. And I thought last year, Mike Elko saved Brian Kelly's job. Well, Moorhead is gone. And so now is Mike Elko. And Notre Dame has had a tumultuous offseason. And that's who we open the year with. And that, I think, is a must win for the Michigan football program. When we come back, we'll find out what does Chris Ballas of the Wolverine think. Stay tuned. If you're not yet a Patreon supporter for Michigan Podcast, take a look at what you missed immediately following Michigan's huge win over Michigan State. We had an instant reaction podcast for our supporters, breaking it all down 
right there at patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. And again, we want to thank all of you who helped to cover uh, some of the costs, the overhead it takes to produce uh, this really for YouTube anyway, a high level production, the graphics and everything else. You know, as my old college roommate, Mike Bartram used to say, romance without finance, a damn nuisance, right? So, I mean, someone had to pay for all the equipment and someone had to supply the mediocre talent that you are watching right now. So thank you to those of you on our Patreon page that are contributing to help make this possible. And you too can contribute as well and get extra special content exclusively for you by being one of our Patreon supporters. Chris Ballas of the Wolverine joins us now on this week's episode of Michigan Podcast to give us his thoughts on some of the big issues facing the Wolverines this offseason. Good to see you, Chris. How are you? Steve, doing great. Thanks, buddy. So when you look at this offseason, and I'm going to have to figure out that I've got to put a disclaimer on everything I say. Okay, so I put out a tweet over the weekend when we added the uh, grad transfer from Utah. Long guy, apparently has really good speed, might be a guy that can cover in the slot, which was really the one remaining weakness left on our returning defense. And I I noted his addition, and if you bring in the grad transfer from Rice, who I'm sure we'll talk about, who can play tackle and is being recruited by a lot of big-time schools around the country. And if Shea Patterson's eligible, then that would really address the three major personnel problems Michigan faces with guys who have proven production on the college level and then therefore in my view there would be no excuses for next year a bunch yeah. of people immediately took that to me well if that means if they don't win the whole thing harbaugh's fired I, maybe this is the world in which we live I, I was just analyzing the season chris i mean i'm pretty outspoken when i think we ought to fire a coach i'll say so i thought we should have fired john beeline a year ago and said if we made the NCAA tournament i'd take a pie to the face i was dead wrong about that and had my kids come on here and put a pie to my face okay so i, I just was talking about prospects for next year but is that indicative of, of maybe our fan base is a little on tilt right now chris well yeah I mean, when you go this long without a uh, without a big 10 championship right we're not talking about winning national championships here yet we're talking about winning a big 10 championship and you have to go back to the 1950s to, to find a drought that's similar to this one uh, and it's ridiculous so yeah i think they're a little bit on edge and there's reason to, for concern this was not jim harbaugh's best coaching season and i think he would be the first one to admit it so when you're looking at areas in which you need to improve i think you nailed them but you never know when it comes to grad transfers how they're going to pan out and how they're going to play you look at Wayne Lyons a couple of years ago and everybody mm-hmm. thought oh this is a guy that they're getting from Stanford who's going to come and compete right away he was really more of a special teams guy so you're hoping that Casey Hughes is going to fill out the depth on that at that safety position and become more of a cover guy there uh, you're hoping that you can get a guy like Calvin Anderson from Rice who's now visiting you know places like Auburn like Texas so it's going to be hard to get him but uh, you know you never know and uh, but you do have some some areas in which you need to fill quarterbacks the big one if you get great quarterback plays we've seen several different places you look at uh, San Francisco with Garoppolo this year, and if you look at Georgia, what was the difference between their year two years ago and this year? It's great quarterback play. That's where it starts. That's why they need Shea Patterson to be eligible. All right, let's start there then with quarterback and, and Shea Patterson since you went there on your own. I have a hard time believing. I, I've, I've believed he was going to be immediately eligible because the NCAA is trying – it's nothing to do with my Michigan fandom. They're, they're trying to stay out of court, Chris. They're getting their ass kicked every right. time they go. And the, yep. la- and the last thing they want um, probably is a case that, that opens up the prospect of, of really the lack of, of, of balance in the contract of a letter of intent, the lack of consideration received be- from this, to the student athlete. in a, He's essentially agreeing to a one-way non-compete, which in our industry – Every time we challenge one-way non-competes, we always win in court. It's just few of us have the money to actually do it. That's why we sign on. I don't think the NCAA wants that lawsuit. Now you tell me that the story was out at the convention last week, that next year they may have a vote on whether to give underclassmen a one-time ability, if they have a 2.5 or 6 or better, that they can exercise a transfer for any reason at all once and be immediately eligible. I have a hard time believing if this stuff is on the table for consideration. They're going to tell Shea Patterson and all these old Miss players that were brought to, that were brought there with the understanding that they weren't going to lose a, a bowl season. They're going to tell them to sit out a year. It just doesn't, just doesn't seem like that's the environment happening right now, Chris. No, I, I agree 100. percent And boy, what a free for all that would be, right? It'd be like free agency on on these guys. It's opening a can of worms if they do that, and I hope they don't. But I think you're absolutely right. And you know, behind the scenes, that Shea Peter Patterson's people 
are telling them that. They're saying, hey, uh, this is what you're facing if you decide not to let this kid be immediately eligible. They think they've got a great case, Steve. So we'll see how it plays out. And we know how important that is to Michigan's chances, obviously. We saw Brandon Peters in the bowl game, and, and, and you know he looked okay at other times during the season. Dylan McCaffrey is a kid who's coming in and they love. Uh, is he going to be ready, though, to be that guy? You're talking about a quarterback that's got to go into Notre Dame in that first game and play well because Michigan needs to win some games this year. It doesn't matter where they're playing them. They've got to win some games. So uh, I'm with you, by the way, when it comes to Jim Harbaugh. They're not going to fire him, and he's not in a fireable position. But this is a year where, after a bad year, you really need that to happen. They need some things to start going their way. Shea Patterson would be a great place to start. Yeah, I mean, we've rebuilt. Let's just get this out of the way now since it came up. We've mm-hmm. rebuilt a decimated season ticket base. Our brand is 100 times beyond what it was uh, 48 months ago, 36 months ago. Um, we, we're not going to fire, arguably, our most popular, greatest living player, not named Tom Brady, who's winning over 70% of his games and could have right. any NFL job opening he wants the minute he puts himself on the market. That's just crazy talk. I know adulting is hard, okay? But let's take that <laughs> off the table and recognize, though, last season was disappointing. It, it, we, we, if we've got to actually start winning some significant games. And when I listen to, let's go to the offensive line when I listened to you and Doug Skeens and watched your breakdown and I even shared this on my own Twitter account when I hear a guy who used to be an all Big Ten lineman using terms like and I quote loafing when 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 he says stuff like Les Miles would have yanked my ass off the field and charged me a ticket for standing around and watching like that okay when when I hear that stuff I'm asking myself and 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 I can see why Doug is is saying it because I'm watching the same video he is right so it's not like he's analyzing this in a vacuum he's showing you loafing and saying here that's loafing I but I, as I watch and I'm thinking to myself what in the Sam Hill went on for 15 bowl practices what about the way the season ended made a bunch of guys who underperformed all year sit there and think you know what this is kind of you know mail this bowl game in that makes no sense to me at all chris right and you look at you know everybody wanted to blame brady hoke and his staff and say okay well they just weren't getting coached correctly you know and look how these guys are doing in the pros now kyle kalis has actually made played in the nfl and so is eric magnuson and these guys but something's not working man and you look at the steps and when you sit there and you watch it with a guy who's actually played the position before and you talk to guys like john jansen who played at a high level here and they're saying look that can't happen you know and you can point to one game in that ohio state game where your center pat kugler takes a misstep a false step on the first one and uh, john corn trips over him and instead of you know a second and one play goes into third and four fourth and four you, you miss a couple of passes that changes the whole tenor of that game they had a great chance to win that game down the stretch and had a second and one play going down look like they were going to score a touchdown so those are things that can't happen and never should happen and they do every now and then but when you see them over and over and over again in a year and you're wondering okay what's going on here is this a systemic thing is this a coaching thing is this just the players aren't getting it uh, you know, you can do a lot of things. You don't have to be the most, most physical guy to play with great technique and to do the right thing. And we've seen that at Michigan State. I hate to bring it up, but it's an absolute fact. If you look at their offensive line, they uh, overachieve at times. And uh, and you haven't seen that at Michigan with higher rated talent, guys that are going on to play in the league. So something's got to change there. And it is interesting listening to Doug Skeen talk. If you guys haven't yet, you need to, because this guy has lived it. And when he talks about Les Miles and he talks about this is what Les would have done to us and you read the stories and you can't do it obviously anymore but of Bo Schembeck were taking a, a yardstick to mm-hmm. somebody's to the back of somebody's calf because they're one inch off you know those are the technical details and the little things that separate wins from losses good offensive line play from bad offensive line play and in my opinion that is the biggest area of concern going into next year Steve especially at the tackle spot are they going to be able to shore that up Chris Ballas from the Wolverine with us here on our special offseason preview of Michigan football this week here on Michigan podcast when you look at that unit depending on which young guys emerge I don't think talent's going to be an issue. I don't. I, you could always have more depth. They're going to have 12 scholarship linemen at least on next year's team, which means you only play five at a time. That means you're at least two deep at every position. It's possible they could put five top 100 national recruits on the field, on the offensive line at the same time, depending on how some of these younger guys like a Filiaga develops in the offseason. They're bringing in Ed Warner, who is considered one of the – his position's not yet fully announced, probably because we're waiting to see what will happen with Pep Hamilton after signing day uh, in the NFL. But 
Uh, this is a guy that, as an offensive coordinator, when you talk to Ohio State people, and I read some of what they thought about him as an OC, it's very similar to what we are saying about Tim Drevno, but also his past at Ohio State and everywhere he's been as an offensive line coach, he's considered one of the best in the business. Do you expect that's going to be his area of focus at Michigan? It's got to be, right? And you look at it and everything, everybody who talks about him says, talks about him as a technician and how good a coach he is in that area. Why else would they be bringing him in, right? And uh, and this is nothing against Tim Drevno. At the same time, you look at it and the proof is in the pudding, man, and, and the product that you're putting out there on the field, it just has not been good enough. I, I can honestly say that since 2007, probably, Michigan has not fielded an offensive line worthy of Michigan. If you go back, uh, it wasn't that long ago that Michigan was offensive line you and putting these guys in the pros left and right. Uh, that's not happening anymore. You see the occasional one, Taylor Lewan, Patrick Oman, Tommy, to his credit, started uh, for Jacksonville against New England. But you're talking about guys here that play as a unit where the, the weak link is still a guy that's going to be playing at an all Big Ten level. And your second stringers, you know, go ba- way back to the early 90s, your second stringers are guys that would come in and not miss a beat because they were so well coached and they were so technically sound. We have not seen that. So, and I don't put a lot of stock into those numbers anymore, unfortunately. I remember the class with Blake Bars and mm-hmm. Logan Tully Tillman and all these four star guys where you're thinking, okay, was that guy really any better than some of the guys that you're seeing that were rated below them at Iowa and in places like that? Uh, and the answer has been no. So, but you got to get the most out of the talent that you have there. To me, it's going to be about finding a couple of guys, a couple of tackles. Last year, arguably, they were playing five interior linemen on that offensive line. We saw Mason Cole, who's going to be playing on the interior line, and his the best position was probably center. So find a couple tackles, and you got to get back to the point, too, Steve, where you're not – having to get to those grad transfers. And I understand the Grant Newsom situation with him getting hurt really put them behind the eight ball there. But you want a program where you're not rebuilding with grad transfers or JUCOs. We used to make fun of programs. Hey, they're plugging in a bunch of JUCOs, right? Uh, They must be in trouble. You want to get to the point where your guys that you're recruiting are panning out and playing at a high level. And then after a couple of years, they're being replaced by other guys who are well prepared to play. Are you surprised at the level of turnover there's been on the coaching staff this offseason, or is it on par with what you expected? You know, it's fair to, to say that Jim Harbaugh, you know, it's hard to work for the guy, and it is. The guy calls himself the jackhammer, and we and I think there's some burnout there uh, without question. I am a little bit surprised, and I don't think it's ideal because, again, when you're building something, unless you're sending guys – for example, like Bo Schembechler did, guys that are running other programs and guys that are too good to stay, then uh, you'd like to have those guys that, hey, that you're building around. Uh, and then, you know, after a couple of years, they get sent on and you go out and get the best of the best. But uh, I think it was a paramount, though, some of the guys that they kept, Chris Partridge, for example, a great recruiter. And I think they need a few more of those. And you're hoping that they got them with the hires that they brought in. Al Washington, for example, Sharon Moore. These are guys that are supposedly great recruiters and up and comers in the profession that those are the kinds of guys that you'd like to see so but you would like to see a little bit more stability in my opinion and uh we'll see where it goes i still think there might be another another move or two here before it's all said and done let's talk about coach harbaugh in in particular a lot was made and and sometimes these just become you know uh, fan urban legends like if you're a longtime Michigan message boarder on various forums, the legend of Kelly Baraka. I mean, some of these just become message board urban legends, okay? But that doesn't mean always they're wrong either. And there's been a lot of talk about coaches' demeanor this offseason. And when you see, or during this past season, when you see stats like um, our, our team for the second year in a row led the Big Ten in sacks and tackles for loss on defense. And in the last two years of, of, of 18 Big Ten games, we've had a total of six holding calls against the other team, which means they must just be blocking freaking perfect. We get home right. or they block us perfect. That's crazy. That's ridiculous. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll go back to the Ohio State game in 2016. We get eight sacks. They run the ball 50 times. No holding calls the whole game. Come on, man. Okay. But and a lot of our fans watched his almost flaccid demeanor. And there's been a lot of theories about this. His old man spoke to him and said, you're overreacting. It's the new rules of the Big Ten, which maybe they put in specifically because of him and the way he goes after the referees. Maybe he was even aware of the fact the team was young and wasn't ready to contend yet, and there wasn't really a point in expending his energy at a level with youngsters that just couldn't do, weren't ready to do what he needed them to do. How much of any of this do you buy into, Chris? All I know for a fact is that he seemed different. And I think anybody who watched it could sense it, that this is not the guy that, you know, somebody 
gave it to me this way. They said, where's that fire breathing dragon that mm-hmm. we hired to really come in here and shake things up? And, you know, a lot of people were disappointed when he called out Mark D'Antonio. And I'm thinking, well, it's about time here. This is the kind of the guy that you were expecting. OK, we're going to meet this challenge head on. And uh, a lot of people saying stuff with him not firing back. And D'Antonio was one of them. So uh, I thought that was pretty interesting and really maybe a sign that Jim Harbaugh is getting back to, to getting that edge a little bit because it seemed like he lost it. Let's face it. Uh, when you're when your program we thought after Brady Hoke left, you know, it was an embarrassing stat, the way that they were giving up tackles for loss on the offensive line and sacks and things like that. We thought that would never happen under a Jim Harbaugh. Well, it did. And uh, there might be many different reasons for it. At the same time, you don't expect that to happen. I thought that the team that we saw in the first two years under Jim Harbaugh was extremely well coached. You saw that fire from him. Um, maybe he did know. Maybe he understood from what he saw on the field that, okay, you know, our offense isn't going to quite be there. But I never got that sense going into that season season last year uh, based on what they had coming back on defense all they had to do was be adequate on offense I don't think that he was really thinking that hey we're never going to get there we can't get there I think that's uh, that's false so there are a lot of theories out there about why he didn't have that same amount of fire Um, but he's been telling recruits he said look this is you know last year was the anomaly and based on his career and what he's done at other places, I think that's probably right. Now we're going to find out. And uh, with that schedule next year, they could have a much better team and still lose three games. And and you can say, oh, well, that wasn't such a bad season. But now you're running out of time here. When you're losing to rivals, doesn't matter how you're doing it. When you're losing to Michigan State, Ohio State, you got to start winning games. And it really starts in South Bend in 2018. You buy any of the other message board urban legends about – how much time can he have to coach with podcast and we're doing this and we're going here and we're going there and and now we got this Amazon series which yep. I got to be honest I'm I'm sort of dreading given the season that they were five <laughs> yeah yeah that, that was not the ideal season to be chronicling uh, in front of the country but you buy any of that talk at all or is that is that sort of when you're when if if when it, your coach is, is, is you know, uh, cantankerous and you're winning, he's fiery. When he's yep. cantankerous and you're losing, well, I can see why the team lacks discipline, right? So yep. d- are, is there anything to that or is it just we're, our reaction to a lack of success on the field? I think it's fair to say that it's probably a reaction. Uh, is he spreading himself too thin? I think only he could tell you that. You know, he's got a new baby now, and he's got a lot of family responsibilities and everything else. But they're still planning on going over to France, going to Normandy and Paris. That That's still on. Um, but you haven't seen him in the limelight as much, and maybe part of that is because, hey, they aren't winning as much. And there was a sign in his office that we saw recently right behind him that said, just coach the team. And I think you're getting more and more sentiment from the fan base that, hey, you know, it's great to be out there and doing some of these things that you're doing, but it's better if you're doing it when you're coming off an 11-1 season or something like that and going to the playoff or winning Big Ten titles. They want to see that. Now, in fairness, I think a lot of people thought that last year was going to be a step back, but when you're losing to a rival like Michigan State at home, it doesn't matter that you're playing your backup quarterback. doesn't matter that you're playing in a monsoon. All they realize is that you lost that game. They want to see wins first. All the other stuff is secondary, so you're going to hear that. There's always going to be criticism, not just from Pete Feinbaum, right, from, but from some of the fan base because – you're not winning those games and they're the ones that have to put up with it at the water cooler from the state fans and from the Ohio state fans telling them you're never going to get there. Your savior is never going to get you there. So I think it's a little bit of both, but I think you're going to see a committed Jim Harbaugh. Uh, This guy from what the people that we've talked to close to him, he's as committed as ever to the cause and to really, and as competitive as ever. And that's really what you need from that position and from that guy. That's who you hired. Final question on coach Harbaugh. And then one final question on what we've talked about overall This is one of those observations that when you have a broader view from the cheap seats, like I do, and you're obviously much closer to the program, you can sometimes think things are more simple than they really are. On the other hand, sometimes you can see the forest through the trees when you're not right in front of it. And 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 so not knowing which it is, I ask this question with that disclaimer. Sure. When, When we look at the chain of command on defense... I think most Michigan fans were worked up about losing Chris Partridge from a recruiting standpoint. I bet you most of them didn't know what he actually coached on defense. Right. I I mean, there is a clear chain of command. We know. We know who the guy – we know who the patent in the front tank is. We know that. It's Don Brown. Chris Zordich is a fantastic defensive backs coach, for example. Most Michigan fans don't even know his name. We know who the chain of command is, where the buck stops. Mike Zordich. Yes. I'm sorry. Thank you. I was talking about that. I'm showing my age now Talk about the old Notre Dame All-American. There you go. Thank you. Um, On offense, when when I watch guys like you ask the players who calls the plays and they give you a deer-in-the-headlights look – 
I wonder if we, if things just need to be more simplified. I, I wonder if we don't need – coach doesn't need his own Don Brown. I, I don't know what – for his system, what quarterback coach, what offensive coordinator we're going to hire better than he is. Why not simply hire the best – technical coaches from a position standpoint you can find starting with that abomination of intercollegiate football called our running backs and pass pro we saw last year which was an, an insult if i if i blocked like that in skra football at jackson park junior high in grand rapids michigan coach bernie van tynan would have grabbed my prepubescent butt by the, by the short hairs and thrown me off the field let alone scholarship chicken wing scholarship blocking Start, right. go get the best technical coaches you can find and let jim call the place he's the let him be the oc be his own don brown that's exactly you what you beat me to it steve it's exactly right i was going to say you are don brown be the don brown of the offense because you've done this before this is your team and i said at the beginning of the year i thought are they overthinking this thing they're bringing too many guys in here you've got two offensive line coaches now that have two run two different styles you've got a passing game coordinator you got a run game coordinator you got analysts for this analysts for that are you overthinking this and making it tougher than it needs to be and we saw during the middle of the year they finally started getting back to to some of the the things that he really preaches in tough football and, and running between the tackles, starting with the Indiana game, I think it was, when Karan Higdon ran for 200 yards, do some things really, really well. And, uh, you know, people got on Lloyd Carr for that, you know, well. But they were there were things that people couldn't stop that they knew were coming. And uh, But when you have so many different formations and so many things and you're taking so much input, you have a tendency, in my opinion, to overthink things. And I talked to a couple of people about that, and they agreed. They said, yeah, maybe that's an issue. So, But Jim Harbaugh is a great football coach. I don't think anybody – is debating that and he, I think he needs to rely on himself and his instincts a little bit more than rather getting all this stuff and having the, the proverbial too many cooks in the kitchen right and and that seems to be the way that it played out so I agree with you 100% Steve. Final question then Chris are we guilty of over analyzing things is it just as simple as we have a program that was giving tickets away for a Coke Zero that had on-campus riots about getting rid of the athletic director just four years ago. And and here we are. We have the 12th best record in college football. We are losing our minds over recruiting class that has a composite ranking right now, I think a 14th or 15th in the nation. And if you look at uh, outside the top four or five classes, the difference between number eight and number 21 is like one or two points in all of these services. They're always so close. Yep. Um, and, and we had we had to replace. 17 starters we had the youngest team in college football our very first episode of michigan podcast i looked at the four-year roster foundation of talent of all the major conference teams michigan had the 16th most talented team in my rankings going into last year chris but by far they had the most talent in the in the previous two or the most two immediate recruiting classes about 75 percent of michigan's talent that they had returning for this season were in the 2016 and 17 recruiting classes nobody else was even close to that are we guys like you and i that are we think have pretty good standing on the criticisms we're actually seeing are we overthinking this a little bit yeah, I think that's a fair question. Everything you said, I think, is fair. At the same time, you look at last year and you think, okay, this team that we saw in Jim Harbaugh's first two years is not the team that we saw, the well-coached team that we saw last year. And there were holes on in some areas. There's no question about it. But when you've got a championship-level defense – uh, you know, like they did. And and people can say what they want to about Don Brown on third down. You look at the statistics and you look at the games. There was only one game all of last year that the defense didn't play well enough to win. That was against Penn State. All you needed was an adequate offense in order to win 10 games, in my opinion. And there were times that it looked like a poorly coached football team. And you're thinking, OK, that's not right. That is not what we're used to seeing. And I don't think we've ever seen that from a Jim Harbaugh coach team in his career. So but you give him a pass. Right. And you think, OK, is this the new norm under Jim Harbaugh? Probably not. This is going to be, you know, they're going to come back and, and they're going to do some things and fix some things and and things are going to get better. But when you look at the way they lost some of those games, when you look at the tackles for losses, when you look at the sacks and the guys making the same mistakes over and over again, uh, even with the quarterback issues that they had and the injuries, well, those were caused by some of your from some of your deficiencies up front, and that should not happen. So uh, from that standpoint, I think it's disappointing. But to expect it to be that way going forward, I think is ridiculous and it's not like Jim Harbaugh forgot to coach so that's why when everybody says all oh, this programs you know going down the down the downhill and they're never going to recover I think that's ridiculous you still got one of the best coaches in football 
assuming he's the same guy. And again, you know, we're going to find out in 2018. Uh, I think a lot of about Jim, who, Har- who Jim Harbaugh really is. I think he's going to. We're going to see that he's that guy that he's been all along, and that last year was just an anomaly. All right, I lied. One more quick one. How no much? How, how much of the angst we are we have as a fan base right now is is how much of our perspective on this season is different if everything else you mentioned is the same, but we just beat Michigan State? How much yeah. of our angst about this season is really about the missed opportunity we had in, in his year two? You know, Kirby Smart inherited a roster very similar to the one that Jim yep. inherited, a young team that just was waiting to be developed. And they went eight and five his first year, and then the second year they had the glass ceiling and they kicked it open, right? Yep. The second year we we had we kept bumping our head up against that glass ceiling at the end of the year if we win any of those games at the end of the year Iowa Ohio State especially even the Orange Bowl and they, and that's an 11 win season or if they even get to the Big Ten Championship or the playoff how much differently is eight and five looked at this year yeah, I think there's no question about it. And the Michigan State game this year, I think, is the big one because that's the one you're losing at home, and now you've got everybody talking and everybody chirping that you can't beat your rivals, so on and so forth. And they played a horrible game. It took five turnovers, you know, to, to lose that game by four points. You still had a chance to win it at the end. They gave basically gave that game away. But I think you're right. Uh, but I think one of the best things, and I was having this discussion today with a, with a friend of mine, one of the best things that maybe happened, and you hate to say it, is losing that South Carolina game because if you're nine and four and you're thinking okay, everybody's, everything's still great, and you still won nine games, and you're still ascending. That would mask some of the problems, but uh, maybe a little bit, bit of masking tape. And I think there are some bigger issues that they needed to address. I think that'll make them a little bit hungrier. I don't think there's anything really good that comes from a loss, obviously, but my point here being that, okay, they understand that there are some things that they really need to address, and uh, hopefully he makes the changes that he needs to make. You know, he talks about meritocracy, and we've seen guys coming and going, but, you know, it's the same with the coaching staff, man. If guys aren't getting things done, you've got to go out and find somebody who's going to do it and look in the mirror and really examine, and I think that's what that South Carolina game is going to do with Jim Harbaugh and really get him vamped up and, and amped up, rather, for this uh, for this season. It's funny you mention that. The only time I've ever rooted against Michigan my whole life is um, the 05 Alamo Bowl, we were yeah. a four-loss team. Uh, a huge, we were one of the biggest favorites of the bowl season against Nebraska, just like we were last month against South Carolina. And my fear was if they win that game and get 8-4 and four and finish in the top 25, it's going to be your kind of typical, well, we just had a bit of a rebuilding year, yada, yada, yada. Whereas yep. I thought if we lost that game that and, and go 7-5, and five, that may cause um, some of the, uh, the the typical IBM mentality in Lloyd Carr's program to get a little bit more aggressive about addressing some of those things, and they did lose that game. Yep. And then the next year opened uh, one of their one of the opening games at Notre Dame, and that was the last time Michigan has beaten a ranked team on the road was yep. that game against the Irish. Let's hope circumstances repeat themselves. Good to see you, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Steve, thank you very much. Take care, man. Chris Ballas from the Wolverine with us here on Michigan Podcast. There's a look at The Athletic, our partners here on Michigan Podcast. Some of the best online sports commentary you'll find anywhere on the interwebs over at The Athletic. And right now, through our partners at Detroit Sports Podcast, you can get a discounted subscription to The Athletic. Promo code DSP, D as in David, SP as in Paul, DSP. Promo code DSP at the Atla- at theathletic.com. This week's Twitter poll results, we asked you, what is the biggest offseason key for Michigan football? 9% of you said develop more team toughness. 13% say, hey, I'd like fiery Jim Harbaugh to return. 34% of you said improve the offensive line. But the number one answer, the plurality of you, 44% say, is Shea Patterson going to be eligible or not? That's the biggest offseason key for the Wolverines. Now our question of the week here on Michigan Podcast. This one comes from Dev. Do you think our season rests on whether or not Shea Patterson is eligible? I wouldn't quite go that far. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say abandon hope all ye who enter if the NCAA does not clear him. But I do think it widens the margin for error, especially when there's not a game before that Notre Dame game. And even though Notre Dame's had a tumultuous offseason, let's face it, we have seen 
some really good Michigan teams go to South Bend and come out a loser. I go to the only time I've been to South Bend to see a, a game, and it was Michigan-Notre Dame in 2004. And one of my listeners who is an usher at Notre Dame got me and my father-in-law really good seats to go and invited us to spend the entire day on campus. We had a great time, went to the grotto, hung out, first down Moses, touchdown Jesus, saw it all, uh, went to the museum. It's just a terrific place of tradition, just like we have in Ann Arbor. And I was listening on my Walkman. That's what we used to listen to back in those days, kids, back in the way back years of 2004. I was listening to uh, WNDU, I think was the station there in South Bend, and their, their all-day pregame show leading up to the game, man, and they were just trashing Tyrone Willingham and talking about what a disaster the Notre Dame program was and how it had reached a crossroads, and they eventually turned out to be right, you know, but um, we lost to them that day even after all that hand-wringing. So we have seen very good Michigan teams. That was a Michigan team that won us our last Big Ten title in 2004. We have seen very good Michigan teams go to South Bend and lose. Okay, so you want, when you're going there, if you're a Michigan fan of any historic proportion at all, Coach Harbaugh should remember from his one and only game as a starting quarterback in South Bend. His team was number two in the country, Lou Holtz's very first game, and they won a real humdinger, as Sports Illustrated said, 24-23, to because one of the greatest kickers in NFL history, John Carney, badly missed a game-winning field goal at the end, allowing the Wolverines to hold on. So when you're going to South Bend and you're wearing that winged helmet, man, you want as much margin for error as you can have. And I think a playmaker that's proven like Shea Patterson gives us more margin than Brandon and Peters or Dylan McCaffrey does but hey if it turns out he's not eligible you still have to trust that with Jim Harbaugh's record and another full year of development one of those guys at some point will be ready just not entirely sure they're going to be ready for a road game at South Bend as much as say Shea Patterson would be well let us know what you think about what we think you can follow us on Twitter at Michigan Podcast. If you have a question you'd like us to tackle, you can also send it to us via Facebook as well. If you miss any of our episodes or any of the things we say, michiganpodcast.com is a great place where all of our archives are archived, hence the name, archive. I want to thank all of you for watching here this week on Michigan Podcast. Chris Ballas of the Wolverine for joining us, our partners at Detroit Sports Report uh, for getting us out there as well. Back at it again next week. Until then, go blue.